So welcome to the Compassionate Capitalist podcast and video for those that are watching today. Uh, you know, one of the things that we talk about on this show with our whole goal of growing economy by um, creating the ecosystems of entrepreneurs and investors that come together with this common goal of bringing innovation to the market, creating jobs and creating wealth for those involved when those companies succeed. You hear so much about Silicon Valley and Boston, New York, and then there's, you know, these occasional things where there'll be groups of, of investors or folks that we like the rise of the rest and looking into these other markets where there's not as much or hasn't been as much focus on, you know, the cultivation of capital in there and the cultivation of, of entrepreneurism. And so much of that is um, changing now. And, and my guest today is, is a big part of that, uh, that change to identify opportunities outside of the most likely places that you would expect it. And when I first met him or first became introduced to him through an event going on in Louisiana, the Brew 10, and we had a subsequent conversation. And then I found out, you know, how active and proactive they are in may in in doing just that i was like you got to be on the show so uh wave cliff it's cliff whole camp with cultivation capital let me introduce you about uh, uh a little bit about cliff before we bring him on to actually start talking about the all of this stuff right so he heads up the cultivation capital vc fund out of greenville south carolina which is of course not one of those things that hits lots of radars as a big vc marketplace or you know lots of entrepreneurism going on there but and so it's a secondary office to where their fund is headquartered out of st louis and then, and they moved there he moved there with this very specific intent as a strategic location for these undercapitalized markets uh, the fund was started in 2012 and initially focused on software tech and has now expanded into uh, biotech, ag tech, and geofacial tech, which is really interesting. And we're going to get into that kind of stuff. But before and before venturing into the world of the v, of VC, Cliff was the founder and president of Foot Healers in St. Louis and pioneered a new concept in healthcare services. He experienced rapid growth, opening seven retail healthcare centers in five years with a model that each location got profitable within 12 months. And he successfully exited that business with an acquisition to a private equity fund, which is a topic that we've had of late is how do you prepare to exit to a private equity fund? So please go listen to those particular podcasts um, when you want to learn more about that. So it's really exciting, Cliff, uh, to have experienced as positive results as an entrepreneur and now to sit on the other side of the table to be investing and helping other entrepreneurs achieve success. So, you know, that's what compassionate capitalism is all, compassionate capitalism is all about, right? And uh, welcome to the Compassionate Capitalist Show. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good to be here. So... As I reviewed your bio and after we talked, I was surprised to see that you had been in IBM in sales almost around the same time that I had. So really? connect the dots of, yeah, different regions, right? But, uh, yeah. and I mean, probably even different divisions, but I was like, oh, wait, you know, we might, I don't think we ever cross paths, but <laughs> anyway, so, so connect the dots for the audience on how do you go from being in IBM sales to starting to see what is really sort of like a totally unrelated business, a foot doctor healthcare centers, <laughs> right? Into Sounds being, kind of crazy, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and then becoming, you know, industry makers as this, you know, in this VC world of these very specific high tech industries, you know, that, that's uh, connect the dots for us. There. Well, I, I worked in sales for IBM. And, and that was my first job out of college, but not my first job in sales. Um, I worked in sales pretty regularly as summer work uh, growing up in high school and college. And I'm a very big advocate on the importance of getting experience in sales. And when I talk to young people and they ask, well, what's the best kind of job I could do to get business experience? You know, I wanna be a leader, I wanna be a CEO, or I wanna be a founder, I wanna have a senior role someday. What, you know, what experience should I have? I always uh, point to sales as being critical. Yeah. Uh, sales yeah. is leadership. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as an entrepreneur, you're, you're of course are literally le uh, selling your product because at the beginning you probably don't have a VP of sales. You are your VP of sales, 
but leadership is sales because every time you're trying to persuade and convince your team to follow you to your vision of the future, you're selling, right? You're selling them a vision, you're selling a dream, you're selling them a reason to come into the office every single day and do the hard things you need them to do. That yeah. is sales. And it's unfortunate that uh, we all know that sales sometimes has a negative connotation of that used car salesman. And by the way, I do know some good used car salesmen, <laughs> including my own brother, who's, who's not a sleazy used car salesman, he's the good guy. <laughs> But um, that, that's an unfortunate reputation because the truth is every CEO you know, every college president you know, every executive director of a large nonprofit you know is first and foremost working in sales. Oh, yeah. And so actually my first job in sales was uh, working for World Book Encyclopedia. The I best, sold, man. <laughs> I sold encyclopedias back when this was a thing, door-to-door uh, -to -door in South Central L.A., and I learned a lot about how to understand the needs of a customer and how to position what you have to offer on the terms of what their needs are. Yeah. And uh, found actually a great success um, as a high school junior selling encyclopedias. I would sell about two a day and uh, it was a, a ton of commission and more importantly, uh, a ton of learning about um, how to understand people's needs and how to listen first and then talk second. Because if you're not listening first, you don't know the right thing to say. Mm -hmm. So, you know, understanding about people who in many cases were very different than I was, but listening to their needs and understanding how, how education might be a part of what they're looking for. Yeah. Uh, was and to, an amazing experience. Today's market, you'd be the, the guys that come knock on my door that want to sell replacement windows or sell, you know, <laughs> uh, pest control for my yard. Those guys, and sometimes they'll get really good ones. And I go, uh, if you want, stay in touch because someday you're going to be very high up in an organization because you got the skills. Exactly. So, um, so yeah. So, actually, um, I don't think it was that big a leap going from sales eventually into entrepreneurship. The industry's changed. But the idea of listening to a customer and positioning a solution that meets their needs is, is a universal concept. Yes, absolutely. So, so did now, because you also spent some time um, really, I, you know, what is it? You were one of the top 100 entrepreneurship professors in the world and helped co-develop yes. and launch 15 new entrepreneurship courses and founded and launched an NBA entrepreneurship platform. So was yeah. that a, a overlap between being a, a little bit. successful to VC or so all I'm of the above? You, you do it all. I'm glad you asked. You just didn't assume that I was so old. I could have done it all sequentially. <laughs> so yes, there was overlap. So um, uh, the when I sold Foot Healers in 2007, some of the first people I was excited to tell about it were my old college professors from Washington University in St. Louis. And one of them um, said, uh, well, hey, if you've got a little extra time, um, we've got a class that, that needs teaching. Uh, the old intro to entrepreneurship class that you took when you were a student and I'm too busy to teach it. And um, you've always been a great guest speaker for me. Would you be willing to take it on a course? I thought, wow, that sounds like a lot of fun. And, and, and one course, next thing you know, I turned into a full-time faculty position. And I uh, was the first full-time faculty member in entrepreneurship at, at Washington University and started what is today's entrepreneurship program uh, from that position. Uh, it was a great experience. And yeah, through that process, started 15 courses, uh, redid the uh, major, started the minor, built the entrepreneurship platform for the MBA. Really, uh, it ended up transforming our whole school into being uh, having a much bigger focus on entrepreneurship. It's now one of the four pillars of, of the business school at WashU is uh, entrepreneurship. Nice. We, uh, uh, right when I left in 2019, we got all the way to being ranked number one in the world. So, wow, yeah. bravo. It was pretty great. So uh, uh, better to be lucky than good, right? Or a little yeah. bit of both. Yeah. Uh, so that was really exciting. And a nice thing about being on faculty is I was clinical faculty. So I was expected to spend a certain percent of my time in industry and bringing that industry knowledge back into the classroom. So instead of doing research, I was, I was you know, in clinic. 
And so as part of that in 2012 is when I uh, co-founded Cultivation Capital with my partners. Okay. And so uh, at the beginning, I was able to juggle both. And I kind of joke, cause I think back to when we first started and there was five of us that started the company and, you know, day one, we had one portfolio company and, you know, it was pretty light lift with five people in one portfolio. company. <laughs> yeah. So of course that lift gets a little heavier over time. We now have over a hundred. Oh, and wow. So, uh, uh, I, I, I hung on as long as I could to my faculty role, but it, it eventually got to be too much. And I was forced to choose between my, my two loves. Yeah. So uh, not an easy choice, but uh, ended up uh, retiring from Wash U yeah. and, and so I could be focused full time at Cultivation yeah. Capital. So uh, there's, I'm always interested because you had such rapid success with the centers with your company that you founded. Um, did you have investment capital to start that up and, and capital along yeah. the way or was it revenue growth or how did you go about doing that? Uh, I, raised, I raised capital from angel investors. So um, the initial seed capital was raised actually um, Wash U uh, was coming out of the MBA program at Washington University, and that was a great platform for getting attention and building connections. And uh, luckily, uh, my first center was cash flow positive in seven months. So I was able to then fund the additional centers primarily on the cash flow of the prior. Oh, but, wow. Yeah, the whole thing got started with uh, angel investment. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so and um, how real quick, because before we move on to the other topics, I just think it's a good way to kind of wrap it up. How did you know it was time to sell? How did you did, did somebody just come knocking on your door and you were like, oh, it's an offer too good to refuse? Or did you say, I got this plan that says five years or this amount of revenue or this amount of profit and I'm, I'm moving on. I have a vision of where I want to do what I want to do next. I would love for my answer to be the latter, but it was prior. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you know, I, I wasn't looking to sell, but an opportunity presented itself. And when it did, you imagine, you know, wow, what would I do if I were doing something different? And I just uh, uh, thought it would be um, exciting to have another chance to do something new and maybe build something else. And at the time, I thought I would start another company Mm -hmm. And so I was just excited about being at that early stage and starting over again, yeah. because I thought the most fun time was the zero to one was, ah. the, was the most fun part of building the business. And, and having an established small business was not as exciting to me as creating one. Right. So sure. uh, my motivation at the time was more, Hey, the opportunities here, you know, liquidity offers don't come every day. So every yeah. time you get one, that's an important inflection point. Yeah. And, uh, and I thought, yeah, this, this meets my, my goals and um, this is opportunity for me to do it all again. Yeah. So I was just excited by a, a chance to take on new challenges. Yeah. So now did you spend any time um, before, you know, while you were a professor, you're, you're, you know, working with these entrepreneurs, you know, before you went and started uh, Cultivation Capital as an angel investor in the local community? Yes, I did do some angel investing and that's really how I got connected. In fact, that was a perfect segue. I have to tell your audience, I did not coach you. So um, I, I was doing a little bit of angel investing as were my other partners. And at the time uh, we realized that um, there was not a single technology venture capital firm in the state of Missouri. And um, we thought, you know, what's going to happen to our angel investments if we're just going to be investing in these companies that are going to turn around and run out of money in 18 months? Uh, exactly. And so we thought we really need to start building an infrastructure here. We need to start creating an innovation economy and venture capital is a critical component of any innovation economy. And so we really just started out getting all together and combining our efforts and then you know, raising capital from other people to join us. And so that was, uh, um, yeah, it was sort of an, a, a little bit of an organic um, uh, coming together based on the fact that we were all active in the ecosystem and wanted to help bring things to another level. So that's perfect. Yeah, because that's, you know, you, with the, that where you invest at that um, million dollars in revenue, Mark, you know, I guess there's probably other factors associated mm -hmm. with that besides just this hard and fast number what you kind of call late seed stage, I guess, yep. right? Yep. So, and it all, and it really does, it starts when you go to these, 
you know, sort of like the rise of the rest or the outside of your Silicon Valley in New York, Boston area, it's there's always this chicken and an egg, right? You get your entrepreneurs. How do you get your entrepreneurs to get going and believe that they can get going and the angel investors to be able to help the seed that, you know, to get them going. And then that next gap, you know, that's one of the things I know we've struggled for a long time um, since the dot com thing in uh, the 2000s here in Georgia was bringing back that sort of what I call the the capital um, abyss or the capital divide of a company that's a million in revenue versus five million in revenue, right? And that sort of boutique sort of VC firm kind of stuff. So when you guys got together and you're like, you just mentioned about the St. Louis situation and needing this, was it was it harder to focus in that area or was it easier to focus in that kind of an area because there were so many other bigger VCs out here and they, and a lot of other people saw the need for that stage of capital where you were? I think, um, I, I think being a part of a smaller number gives you a nice platform. And so we were given a great platform by being the only technology investor in our state, um, gave you a lot of visibility. And the truth is, even though Missouri is a relatively small state, it still is a platform. And when you're looking at a deal in Indiana, you have a certain amount of respect because of your leadership in the Missouri community. Or when we're in Tennessee, you know, you get, so I do think that, that um, starting as a, a key figure in a small geography can create you uh, can help build a reputation, a platform that you can then expand and bring to other places. Yeah. So a lot of ways, I think, yeah, it might have been advantageous for us. In fact, I know it was advantageous for us to start in a small market uh, and then grow from that nucleus. I think it would yeah. have been much more difficult if we had started in Silicon Valley and been one of many and would right. have been undifferentiated and uninteresting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and just another one of, of uh, you know, looking like everybody else. Yeah, so, uh, I love that we had a chance to uh, to be a leader in the community, to make a, a name for ourselves and our ecosystem, and, and and then to take that platform and bring it to other communities in our yeah. region. I know we've struggled in uh, Atlanta or in Georgia in particular with entrepreneurs that do get that you know get to a certain point, and then they they look around and they feel like they really can't go, they, they got, they have to go to Silicon Valley. We were always like, oh, we lose them to Silicon Valley because we don't, you know, we've had more where some now VCs have recognized the value, the value proposition of investing in companies here. And, you know, we're trying to recruit back to have satellite offices in here in, in our area. So, you know, did you, um, find where was I want two questions here so was Missouri having the same sort of of, of like the exodus of, of entrepreneur capital the entrepreneur you know mindset or the people you know that the resources out of Missouri that was a, a call to action for you and your peers first question and the second question and maybe into that is then you know your conscious decision to choose Greenville as your as another location for your your group so we did see that around the time of the founding of our firm. In fact, our first portfolio company was a, is a, comp was a company called Gainsight. Uh, and uh, Gainsight, uh, only eight months after we invested, ended up uh, getting a follow-on investment from a West Coast VC, moved its headquarters to San Jose. Now, uh, they still maintained a significant presence in St. Louis and still employ over 100 people there today. Um, but we did have that experience of losing the headquarter to the Valley. But about maybe it's been five or six years ago, we started to see that change. And what, and I don't know if you've had the same experience, but what we're finding is, is that now talent is the mm -hmm. bigger constraint than capital. And so rather than the talent moving to the capital, it's flipped and yeah. we're seeing the capital is chasing the talent. And what I'm seeing is that West Coast VCs and Northeast VCs, they don't wanna disrupt a winning team. If you have a team that's highly functional 
and then it's and it's working and they're making the metric the metrics that they need to invest they don't want to disrupt that by by moving it or by changing the ceo um they want to leave well enough alone and and that that change happened i don't know over a period of a couple of years about five years ago and and i haven't seen a company moved in years yeah uh, when we first started it was probably sure. more common than not yeah, but yeah. I'm sure you've seen the same thing that just hasn't been happening. Maybe a little bit is that the, the West Coast is getting a little bit more respect for the rest of the country. I think, though, the main reason really is because talent is the greatest commodity these days, um, not cash. Yeah. And we're seeing that, re that kind of that, that reverse paradigm. Yeah. And I think also the nature of, um, the ability to do more virtually, you don't have to, the whole, we, we've, we're far removed from the idea of everybody's got to be centrally located, you know, not even just what's happened in the last year. I think that yeah. has become much and more, you know, and, and um, recruitment and, and the cost of living and everything is so much higher. Everything's so much higher on the West Coast that you can get a lot more done for less money. Well, and the areas. real problem in the West Coast is employee retention. Mm -hmm. It's a crisis. Um, uh, it is really hard to keep a a high talent employee in, employed for over a year. Um, uh, my data is a couple of years old, but a couple of years ago, the average tenure for an engineer at Google was only 13 months. Oh, wow. And they're getting free massages and vegan <laughs> lunches. And I mean, you can't imagine a, a better employer in the world, but, but everyone's always hopping to the next opportunity. There's such a frenzy. Mm. And what postal firms are finding is that employee retention is much higher in Georgia and in Missouri and in Tennessee and in South Carolina and that people actually stick at a job for a few years. Yeah. They actually yeah. get through. Yeah. And yeah. so um, this idea of employee retention has been a huge factor in, uh, in, in even West Coast firms um, opening satellite offices yeah. outside of California. Right. So talk about Greenville. Why Greenville? Yeah, it's crazy, right? So, um, this really, I, I hate to be such a cliche, but I, I think if it weren't for COVID, I wouldn't be here. Um, this really goes back to uh, April maybe. And uh, it suddenly hit me that our firm is completely virtual and, and working more as, as highly functional as ever. Um, you know, just really not skipping a beat. And it struck me that, you know, I don't have to be in St. Louis. And it never really seemed an option before not to be in our own headquarters. Um, but it, I just realized that am I being the most strategic I could possibly be about where I live? And um, on our tech team, um, all of our general partners uh, live in St. Louis. Now we've had always had principals in other cities and venture partners in other cities, but the, the general partners were all in St. Louis and we all, are sitting there in the same network, right? With the same deal flow. And it struck me if we really want to get serious about expanding and broadening our deal flow, the, the best way to do it is to spread out the team. And sure. to your point about virtual working, there's really no reason not to. Right. And so I did an analysis of, of all the different places that might make sense. Um, our firm has, is prolific in the Midwest. And uh, we are not prolific in the Southeast, not as much. We certainly do business down here, but we, we do not do the volume that we do in the Midwest. And, and, and it should be more even because the markets are similar size. The dynamics of the markets are very similar. The South is a great market for us, just as great as the Midwest. And it, and it should be more, more even. And so I, I focused on the, on the South about where it would make sense. And Greenville for a few reasons. Um, Number one, the ecosystem here uh, reminds me of St. Louis, um, but a few years ago. And so I thought there was an opportunity to make an impact. And we're very much an impact-driven firm. Um, we've always had to build the, 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 the industry in which we're operating in. And so that's very comfortable coming into a, a community that, that has a lot of growth potential and that is uh, emerging. Uh, but it's extremely proximate to both Atlanta and Charlotte, which are larger, more mature ecosystems. Sure. Uh, and not very far from, from Raleigh, fairly close to Raleigh. 
So uh, I thought Greenville would be an interesting split the baby uh, <laughs> strategy where I can be two hours from Atlanta, 90 minutes from Charlotte, three hours to RTP. And can uh, if, if I was thinking of this as a regional play, this was a very central location for me to hit sort of the biggest areas in the region. Very good. Yep, absolutely. Well, we are really glad to have you in the region. So, <laughs> so a good segue to uh, talking about industry. I want to tell everybody, if you want to get more information, they've got some information on the blog and their news section. They've got a list of the companies that they've invested in in the past there. And just go and uh, you know check out cultivationcapital.com, just like it sounds, Cultivation Capital. And they have there, when you first go to the site, and I think this is really terrific because it's everything you've said, it's, it's uh, thriving enterprises, vibrant communities, Cultivation Capital invests in young companies whose ideas have potential to transform the way we live and work, right? That's what your, right. sort of your mission, I guess, is uh, on your thing. So, so that, you know, software, you started in software tech, lots of, of angel groups, lots of people do software tech, plenty of money to be made in software tech. Why shift a focus or expand into things like ag tech and, and geofacial? which is, I guess, is your newest one. Yeah, so it's really about responding to the industry segments that are important in the regions where we operate. So ag is a natural for St. Louis. And, you know, I always will ask, you know, if, if you're going to start an agriculture technology company, it makes sense to be in the Midwest versus Silicon Valley. Right, oh, sure. You're closer to your, your customers, you're closer to the R&D resources, the plant scientists, you know, that's the region where they work and where they operate. That's where the corporate assets are. So, um, you know, as, as you noted, you know, uh, uh, you know, vibrant enterprises, thriving communities, we are all about investing in these, in companies that are gonna contribute to the economic well-being in the communities where they operate. So we're aligning our strategies with the economic development priorities of the communities where we invest. And so ag is the most important industry in the Midwest, as well as in much of the Southeast. And yes. uh, if we're going to have an innovation forward looking ag economy, it needs to be VC. We need startups, right? And so um, same thing in geospatial. Um, this one is a little bit more inside baseball, but the National Geospatial Agency, which is a federal agency, is building a huge billion dollar headquarters in North St. Louis. And so St. Louis is making a play to position itself as a industry cluster for geospatial technologies. And so as such, if we're gonna claim to be a ge geospatial hub, well, we better have an innovation economy, we better have startups and to do that, you need to have venture capital. Yeah. Um, geospatial is an interesting um, segment because it really crosses into a couple other industry segments. So a lot you see in national defense, right? With mapping with regard to spy stuff and military stuff and cool things that I probably don't even begin to understand. Uh, uh, but also it's really big in precision ag and you see a lot in transportation and logistics. So these are all strong uh, industry segments for our part of the country. And they interconnect. And I apologize for those uh, listening. I, yes, I did say facial instead of spatial. And uh, I had that down wrong. I was, uh, I was, my hearing was off from <laughs> before. And I did, I, and I think that's, that's fairly new for you to be getting into that, that it, segment. It's very it? new. We're just now starting to look at those opportunities. So let's talk about what that, um, what, what does that, what, what is ag tech or, and how do, you know, like, what are the problems that you're looking for entrepreneurs to be solving when it comes to, the the crossover or independently you know because i i know one thing i've seen a lot of of at pitch competitions and things like that i've seen these and you know sometimes i don't know that there's a problem because it's not an industry i'm deep into until i see an entrepreneur describing the problem right and so one was all the way to like that last mile particularly in the agricultural space they use chalkboards to write stuff down a little ticky notes and then they try to remember to key it into the computer that they have because handhelds don't really work that well sometimes because they're doing stuff with their hands and 
how do they do that? And so I'm the, the, the getting into using things that are, you know, the internet of things and stuff like that, where they're, and even the, you know, blockchain of tracking data pieces all along the pipeline. So I've seen some solutions out there trying to have better knowledge as to what's happening, where things originate in the agriculture, all the way to where they end up. So is that, it, what, talk about some of the problems that you've seen or you're excited, if there's something that you've recently invested in that you think is really exciting in the, in the space that, you know, is, a, is solving a really key problem that we may not have, sure. other people may not realize it's the average Joe doesn't know that has been a problem. Ag tech is really an interesting field because it, it is broad. It covers a, a, a big spectrum. I think the best way to think about it is to think about the, the value chain. It starts with a seed in the ground and ends up with dinner at your table, right? Right. And it really is everything in that value chain from planting the seed to delivering that meal to your doorstep, right? That whole agri-food value chain. Uh, and, and, you know, the commonalities, it all has to do with the food cycle, with, with you know, providing nourishment for humans and animals, by the way. Um, and, uh, um, and, and that's, that's a major global mission. Um, there are a lot of uh, uh, futurists who foresee a shortage in the global food supply chain over the next... 30 years and are very concerned about food security uh, internationally. And so most of these companies are, are working within that food supply chain to make it more efficient, more affordable, more productive, right? And, and it will create better food for more people to lower cost. And, and uh, actually to talk about that chain, how early we start, uh, I'll, I'll take one that's at the very, very beginning. It's a company called Benson Hill. Benson Hill invented a, a platform uh, that is basically CRISPR for plant science. So, you know, CRISPR for uh, gene editing. Oh, uh, okay. It's CRISPR, for, just like they use in DNA, but DNA for plants. And they have a platform called Crop OS that is used for, um, for, for plant science, for developing new crops, for cr developing, you know, healthier drought resistant crops, a lot crops that are better uh, positioned for the conditions in which they're grown. And many times that might be in, in you know, Africa or in other regions that, mm -hmm. that struggle with agriculture security. Uh, and so, yeah, that's how early they'll go. They'll go even before the seed is born. Yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. The, the very core of the DNA. Of that's interesting. Seed. Yeah, I have a, a cousin who's just a farmer. He's just, a, he just knows how to farm, right? And he got hired by the University of Florida to run their, um, it's like funded by, you know, big corporations, but it's really to do the science of, and tracking like the experiments, like how much water at what rate and the ratio of this, this type of fertilizer versus this type of fertilizer. So they get PhD students out there and he just runs the farm and helps them get all their data points that they accumulate to try to figure out. And I had no idea there's like, and you, I'm sure you know this, there's like a hundred varieties of potatoes, all geared towards when you're know, trying to find crops that'll grow in different types of seasons so we can get out of this food shortage of seasonality and all this research that goes on in the university trying to, you know, improve that, you know, the, the challenges that we have for making sure that we've got food that sustains through all different types of challenges and, you know, all the changes to our climate that's affecting right. the, the temperatures and the access to water or when water is and things like that, and all that kind of stuff. So pretty important stuff. Yeah. Um, so, you know, as you're looking into these kinds of things and you're looking into all these different types of technology, what if somebody is, uh, like, like I just described, it's, it was something that's they're a PhD student or they're a group of people that have seen a problem, they've been working on some kind of solution, but they're, you know, they ha it, it, sometimes it's a challenge if you don't have angel investors 
in a community that understand that industry as well to be able to provide that seed capital. They can get some grants and government stuff to help them, you know, get through their research with SBIRs and say, things like that. Do you see that, is there, are there groups of angels that will invest outside their regions in order to, because they, they have a specialty in, in ag tech, for example, and, and they're looking for those kind of solutions as a precursor to where you would step in? And is there a, because so many times angels are just like my backyard. So when uh, it comes to specific so industries true. like this. You know, angels really do tend to be in your backyard which is one of the reasons why we started and we think it's important to have local capital at all stages. Um, but yeah, back in 2012, Kaufman Foundation did a research project that found that 80% of angel investments are made within 20 miles of the angel's house. Wow. And so, you know, I, I do think that when you get into highly specialized industry specific types of companies, you can broaden that, you can go wider. Um, but I still think you are bound with some of those geographic ties. Ultimately, early stage investing is about the people. It's yeah. about supporting that entrepreneur, right? Because your company doesn't have a brand equity yet. You don't really have a lot of, the company doesn't really have a track record, but the founder does, right? The founder has relationships. The founder has a reputation. The founder has a track record. And, and in those early stages, you're really, raising capital and even just raising, making relationships based on the founder's reputation, not the company's. Now, over time, the company earns its own reputation, has its own track record, has its own network and assets and resources. But at the very beginning, it's all about that founder. So it's very, very personal. So what I find is, is that most angels have some sort of personal affinity for that founder and geography is one. Uh, it might be that they went to the same university or that they might have the same hometown, even if they live in different places now. But, but it could be that there's an industry connection or that you connect to someone who's a CEO in an industry that's impacted by the solution you're trying to solve. But uh, ultimately, it's going to be about your ability to garner a personal relationship. Yeah. And there has to be some hook to, to rest that relationship on, some common affinity to rest that relationship yeah. on. Well, cause I would think that compared to like say software, right? Both uh, geospatial and ag tech and even biotech, that's another one of your categories. Um, they can be kind of capital intensive to get through the MVP and to get to, you know, a million dollars in revenue to get to that, like that heavy lifting that I think that would be, you know, really critical for the angels to be able to play in. So Again, more so, especially in ag and life science right? Because there's a long R&D period that happens before commercialization. Sometimes in software, you can, you can do more of an MVP strategy and create something of value very inexpensively, start getting customer engagement, customer feedback, and you can grow as, and, and add features as you, as you earn revenue. But it's pretty hard to do when you're uh, you know, editing a, a new seed variant. <laughs> <laughs> do you it doesn't see... work that way. And that's you... where you see a lot of grant activity, you know, grant, in, yeah. from, you know, federal grants or for university grants or from other types of sometimes nonprofit organizations that are, that are sponsoring research in certain areas. Do you see corporate ventures getting in that? It's like Del Monte or somebody, are they seeding some of that kind of research um, because they don't do it in-house? Um, I don't know about Del Monte in particular, but we right, do but, see yeah. a lot of corporate venture in ag. They do tend to uh, lean towards later stage though. Yeah. In my experience is they want things that are going to be, that they're going to be able to leverage that technology in a reasonable period of time. You know, they're ready to leverage that technology now. Um, they don't want to wait six or eight years before, you know, a company is, is ready to do business with them. Is the, is the exit for a, a acquisition to corporate funds pretty robust when it comes to ag tech, that kind it of is. thing? Yes. Yeah. So, um, so one of the things I wanted, we start to kind of wrap up here. If, is it like, so like say for example, you know, Greenville or in the re Southeast region now or Midwest, if there was an, um, an angel group, like for example, I have, um, I did an interview a while back with a bio angel out of the Northeast, a bio angel group. And they look at deals all over 
the world actually trying to find things that fit their platform of, of what they invested in. They don't do hardware. They do problem solving kinds of stuff um, at an actual angel stage, you know, and so they are, they are one that's not, you know, all their investors are local, but they do look outside of, of their region. So if there was, uh, because of, of a relationship, an angel group or a small group of, of folks, or somebody said, you know, I love what this, I love this guy, or this gal, the research that they're doing, or the team that they're doing, and all this kind of stuff, but I don't really know if that tech, what they're going to do is sustainable. Is that the kind of thing that you might um, ha give share some of your insights with them on what the industry looks like or something like that? Could a, comp could a company or a group of investors say, yeah, there is opportunity here, come back to us when they reach this stage or things like that? Will you share some of y'all's experience in those particular areas that you're we do focused that? on? Sure, sure. Yep, we do that all the time. Yeah, because I would think I know when I was advising an angel group out of Florida and they were first getting going, one of the biggest advice things that we could have was for everybody in that group to open up their Rolodex of who do they know that they were on boards with that are in different industries and things like that. So they could tap it to find out if this was a potential that could get that next round of financing before they put in their first round of financing on it and, and tap their Rolodex to, to understand that there's a pipeline for where that company is going to go. That is funny because um, you would think that early stage investors would more frequently get the opinion of later stage investors before they make their investments, but they don't, <laughs> but, but it is a good idea. We, we certainly are very focused on what does the acquisition market look like before we invest? It's, it's, it's really the same concept. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's a, that's always, I've always, that's, <laughs> well, I just said it, but it's like, a, it's been one of those things that I'm thinking, why don't they do that more? Cause you look at a lot of companies portfolios and what I focus on now, you know, so part of the reason why I wrote the book was to bring net new capital in for companies at different phases, but one in particular was um, those that have fallen into that gap. They've done, they got to a million in revenue, but they missed their next round of capital. And then they just struggle kind of growing organically. And there's a lot of companies in angel groups portfolios that sit in that middle spot. They haven't yeah. failed, but they haven't reached all the goals that they, the lofty goals that everybody- It's funny you bring that up. I, that's very common in our region because it's fairly inexpensive to do business. So companies can, it takes, they can not die for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> they keep going for a long time. Um, and so what you do tend to see is you, you can get, I guess there's a spectrum, but sometimes you can get on the lower end of the spectrum, the walking dead that can stay alive for a really long time. Yeah. On the higher end of the spectrum, the ones that aren't walking dead that are good companies are just growing slowly. I think that is an interesting and difficult dilemma because I think what a lot of people don't understand in venture capital is that we have to invest in high, very high growth companies, mm -hmm. very high growth. If, if, if a company isn't at our stage, at least doubling every year, preferably tripling every year, uh, it's not growing fast enough to meet our business model. Wow. So we have a business model where, you know, we need to get out from an investment within 10 years and make a return over that period of time. Sure. So if a company's growing 20 or 30% a year, hey, that's good growth, right? I mean, it's a well-run business. It's just not a fit for venture capital. Mm -hmm. It's just not fast enough growth for our business model. And I think right. that's really hard to explain to people who come to us with really great companies and angel groups that are pitching us really great companies that have amazing founders that have really found a lot of success and they might be growing at 50% a year, mm -hmm. which that's in any business, that's fast growth, right? I mean, growing 50% year over year, but it's not fast enough for venture. Yeah. And that's a hard message to explain. And, you know, I, I think that, that you hate to get somebody who's doing such a good job and tell them it's not good enough. And right. not that it's not good enough. It's fantastic. It's just not a fit for our business model. Well, and I think most VC models, that's the reason why there's so much less capital overall invested by VCs than angels. People don't really understand right. that because angels spread it all out, but it's so many of them, you know, and that model, what you just said, 
if they're growing like that, if they're not growing on that compounded kind of growth, well, they're never going to have an IPO. Okay. No. This is not going to happen. So you almost have, you know, I've, I'm working on my second book about scaling and it really sort of tries to address that in, in uh, saying it's, you can do this and you can exit. That's why I do so many things about private equity fund exits is that you can get to this thing and those angels can get an exit, but they need to think about other sources of that growth capital so they could get to the $20 million mark or something along those lines. So, so as we're, you know, wrapping up here, what else have we uh, not covered Cliff that you want to make sure the listeners of, of uh, the compassionate capitalist show, the entrepreneurs, the CEOs, the investors out there, what message, do you want to take with them on uh, optimism for the for the the market to come and where we are in our our growth of entrepreneurism and around the U.S. Well, there's always opportunity. That's the amazing thing, isn't it? That no, there will never be a day where all the good ideas have been taken. This is true. Remember that we always laugh at it when the guy from the patent office said that they needed to close the patent office because there was going to be no new inventions, and there was like <laughs> what it was like. I think it was like 1700 yeah. at that point in time or something like that. And there's now what probably seven, 70 million or something, you know, it's like, there's, there's always, you know, the innovation of the idea of something, you know, but for the warning out there for anybody listening, a patent does not create a business. <laughs> that is true. A patent is a patent. A patent is a patent. It's, paper. <laughs> it's a protection of an idea. So, yep. All right, Cliff, thank you so very much for taking time out to be on the show today. Uh, and I want to encourage everybody to go to cultivationcapital.com, learn more about the about what Cliff and his team is doing. And, uh, and always please visit me at kieranrands.co. You can get information about the book and the services that we offer and onwards and upwards. Thank you, Karen.